Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, new developments in the race to succeed retiring Congressman Ed Pastor. We'll hear about patent trolls and how their lawsuits are impacting business. And we'll learn about a company that makes a variety of products from algae. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Representative Kirsten Sinema said today that she will not attempt to succeed Congressman Ed Pastor, who announced his retirement last week. Pollster Mike O'Neill is here to talk about what it all means and what it all could have meant had Sinema made the move. Were you surprised at her decision? No, no, not the ultimate decision. I'm surprised that it took her three days to make it. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised that one might have a 15-minute conversation in passing. Uh, but for this to have lingered for three days, I heard a lot of anger out there among her supporters, among people who've given money to her, that she would even consider this for more than a really a brief instant. Were you surprised that she considered it in the first place? Well, it's obvious what the calculation was. If I can move to CD7, I can have a safe seat forever. All I have to do is get past the primary. Well, first of all, there's a lot of big ifs there. First, uh, first and foremost among them, that has been clearly identified as a Hispanic seat. And so you would infuriate the Hispanic community by attempting to dislodge that. There'd be a chance for her to win it the first time and the arithmetic would go very simple. Her on the one hand and a large number of Hispanic aspirants for the seat and she ekes by with 29% in the primary and gets nominated. But keep it, I'm not so, I, I suspect she even thought, you know, I could have a primary opponent even if I won that one the first year. And you mentioned uh, a primary, primarily Latino district, not just because of 66% Latino registration in the district mm -hmm. for the Democrats, but the fact is that that was, in a sense, carved out, Voting Rights Act, that, that is supposed to be representative of a particular community. It was absolutely carved out for that explicitly purpose purpose as required by yes. the Voting Rights Act. Do not dilute minority voting strength. So Ed, Ed Pastor got far more Democrats and far more Hispanics than he ever needed to keep that seat because there's a legal requirement that thou shalt never dilute the minority voting strength of a, a majority minority district. If Let's say that uh, between Wilcox, Gallardo, and Gallego, and that's kind mm -hmm. of the top three now going yeah. for that. So far. So far, yeah. And, and I'm going to ask you about this in a yeah. second here. But right now, would she have what you mentioned they would maybe have diluted mm -hmm. a vote if a couple of those had dropped out? Would she still have been a primary winner? I don't think she could win a head to head race against a Hispanic. In Interesting. The but against a multiplicity. Yes of uh, Hispanic opponents split the vote, then, then it becomes possible. And I'm sure that was the calculation. So what does this do now for her uh, campaign in CD9? I mean, if I, you, her opponent obviously will be saying, look, at she's already looking across yeah. the border here, so to speak. I, I think it'll be a momentary ripple, uh, and I don't think they'll make it stick because there's no long, you know, other than the one memo that Bram Resnick published that they were having a meeting to discuss their options. There's no paper trail on this. I think it's just kind of like a Brewer signing uh, or vetoing SB 1062. It seemed to take too long yes. to come to the conclusion, but you ultimately came to the right answer. Okay. Let's go now with uh, Mary Rose Wilcox, uh, Steve Gall Gallardo, and uh, and Ruben Gallego. Okay, three people there, lots of history in that district, mm -hmm. lots of background. One of the candidates announced that he's gay. Mary Rose Wilcox yeah. has a lot of history. Yeah. Who's the front runner there? I really don't know. I mean, I think this has to play out. Let's look and see who raises money. Mary Rose Wilcox had this formidable machine, but the question is, is it decades since it's been, been in operation? Um, you know, 20 years ago, I would say this would be hers for the asking. Uh, uh, I think that's an open question. Th that seat has been owned by Ed for Pastor for so long that I don't think it's possible to say that there's a front runner, nor do I think it's, it's possible to say that the uh, realm of potential 
uh, contenders is, I don't think that list is closed yet. I was going to ask that, and I think you referred to this a little bit. Could someone that we're not even talking about right now come swooping in out of the blue and, and all of a sudden change the dynamics big time? Absolutely. This this is early. This is, you know, three people jumped in, each, I think, trying to preempt the field. Nobody's going to do that. Uh, somebody who could raise some money, who has some identity, and I, I wouldn't even speculate as to the names, but I'm sure there's a lot of people looking in the mirror right now saying I could be the next congressman from that. And, and I, I don't want to go too far on this revenue because the avenue's now mm -hmm. shut down and closed, but uh, let's say Cinema had jumped over to CD7. Yeah. What in the world would have happened in CD9? Would some of the folks running in CD7 jump over to CD9? No, some... I think you'd have a lot of happy Republicans who, are, who, are, who would say, this is a toss-up district. We no longer have to face incumbent. We can take that district. Would you see more names? Would the Vernon Parker decide, oh, I'm back in? I'm I think on the Republican side, you, you could have seen a, a big increase in names. I think what you have in that district right now is Kirsten Cinema has raised a substantial war check. Uh, she has comported herself well, short of this one little dalliance with CD7. Short of that issue, she's comported herself well to become established in that district. And I think most people, myself included, would at this point rate her a clear favorite in what otherwise would be a top up, toss up district. Last question, you, and you kind of alluded to this earlier. What was the reaction? You said anger, state yeah. and national Democrats. Abs absolutely. With real anger, huh? Absolutely. I could have seen a scenario where she runs in CD7, she gets the nomination because the Hispanic vote is split and then loses the seat to a Hispanic independent or Republican, and the Democrats lost CD9 because they no longer have a candidate net Republican increase two seats out of, out of two districts, I think there would have been a furor, and I think her career would have been over. And it seems like most people would have thought something along those lines as well, which makes it, was she seriously considering doing this? Well, it took, all we know, that, that nobody, no reporter anywhere got anywhere near her for the last three days. All I know is it took three days, so I have to assume that she had to have heard the Fuhrer, but I have to assume it was serious because otherwise, not, why not come out after 20 minutes? All right, Mike, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Businesses are expressing increasing concern over patent trolls or groups that file suit to enforce patents even though there is no intent or even capability of producing an actual product. Attorney Brian LaCord of Ballard Spa in Phoenix is here to talk about patent trolls and their impact on some local companies. Good to have you here. Thanks for uh, Give me a better definition of a patent troll. Well, thanks for having me, Ted. A a patent troll is essentially a business or individual that buys or somehow acquires a patent and then uses that patent as a meal ticket in litigation or in an enforcement campaign to try to what I think can fairly be described as shake down prominent businesses to get settlements or bring litigation and try to get damages awards uh, when the patent troll itself is not involved in any sort of actual manufacturing, development, research, or innovation of any kind. I was going to ask, how do you differentiate between a quote-unquote patent troll and, and perhaps someone who's trying to protect an idea that maybe the little guy had over here and the big guy now has uh, appropriated and is not uh, reimbursing? Well, that's a fair question, and, uh, and patent troll is sort of a, a negative term for a company that euphemistically calls itself a uh, an assertion entity, a PAE, patent assertion entity, or non-practicing entity. 
Um, there are small inventors that have legitimate patents, and those patents are at times infringed usually by big companies. But what is more often the case in the last five years is that patents have become a commodity. And those that buy patents for the sole sake of litigating and enforcing them not to protect technology, but to make money off of companies that are not infringing, is the type of operation that I would refer to as a patent troll. That's bad on the economy, it's bad for business, and frankly, it's bad for our patent system. And it sounds like Arizona companies discount tire GoDaddy among those very concerned about this. I think so. I mean, those are certainly companies that I've worked with in patent cases where it's a head-scratching exercise. How in the world can what we do really be infringing a patent? And it's not just retailers. It's banks. It's pizza delivery operations. It's hotels. It's car dealers. I mean, you name it. The, the patent cases that I've been involved with or seen filed in the last few years cover everything from renewing a product on a website, uh, offering Wi-Fi in the lobby, uh, credit card swipe machines, uh, basic fundamental tools of, uh, and methods of business being accused of infringement that one would think is not uh, belonging to one individual as a monopoly in a patent. Are they winning these cases? By and large, they're not. Um, for a time, in Texas, there were a number of very big awards that sort of emboldened patent trolls to file there. Uh, more often than not, these cases are exposed for what they are, dubious. However, it's expensive to litigate a patent case. And so what is typically the operation is to take a patent, try to get a couple hundred thousand dollars in settlement, because that's less than what it would cost to defend, and move on to the next target. Um, that is what can fairly be described as a shakedown campaign, and it's costing businesses millions of dollars. It's costing big businesses, obviously, but if I'm an app developer, for example, and all of a sudden I start getting a cease and desist order or something along these lines from something I, I don't even know exists, that's got to be a problem. I mean, I can see where you want to protect the little guy, but it sounds like some of these patent trolls are going after the little guy. That's right. In fact, the very uh, uh, analogy or example you cited the Angry Birds, a beloved app that my kids play, sued for patent infringement, an app developer. Um, and it was a ridiculous case. It happens all the time. Small businesses, startups, companies introducing new products, launching for the first time, get a cease and desist letter, end up hiring a lawyer, spending a fortune to protect a product. And in some cases, I've seen companies not introduce that product because mm. they can't afford to defend it. That's bad for the economy. So how do we address the problem and how do we do this to ensure that legitimate cases aren't washed away? It's a fair question. And Congress now has before it a very important bill it's considering. It passed the House. It's in the U.S. Senate. It's the Innovation Act. That would curb the litigation abuses. It would expose companies that buy patents and make them more transparent to, to find out if they're really legitimate. It would heighten the standards for proving patent infringement or at least pleading it. And it would create some fee shifting so that if a case is really bogus and a defendant wins, they can get their fees to discourage frivolous litigation. Uh, that's pending in the Senate. It's being considered. There are some alternative measures with similar reforms that have been introduced in the Senate. And the hope is that will uh, me create meaningful reform in the justice system as it relates to patents. If it gets passed the Senate, uh, is this the kind of thing that has bipartisan support, the kind of thing the president would sign? It, it is. It had bipartisan support in the House, and President Obama has been very supportive of patent reform. He's recently announced some executive orders to do that very thing in a small way. If it passes the, the Senate and comes out of Congress, I think the president would sign it. All right. Interesting stuff. Brian, good to have you here. Thanks good for joining us. Good to be here. Us. Thank you, Ted.
Helier is an Arizona-based company that develops advanced algae production technologies for various products, including nutrition, cosmetics, and therapeutics. Helier CEO Dan Simon is here to talk about the growth of the algae industry. Good to see you again. Thank you. Good Let's, to see you again. And is that basically what Helier does? Those, those kinds of uh, algae kind of byproducts or products, I should say? Yeah. We, uh, since I saw you last, the focus has really shifted. We were very energy focused before, and since then we've moved to personal care, uh, health sciences, agriculture, and nutrition. So what's the latest? Let's start with the biofuel aspect, because that's kind of what we were known for, you were known for, I should say, and what we talked about in the past. What's the latest there? So we still think there's an opportunity there, uh, but we think it's way down the path. What we learned over the years as we developed our production methods, that the costs were just too high to current market values. And if we couldn't deliver the algae at current market price, we just didn't want to go there. So we started looking at interesting niche markets that higher, had higher value while our cost of production was still higher. And that includes nutrition? Nutrition. Talk to so us like about that. Astaxanthin. Uh, we make astaxanthin right here in Phoenix at our plant in Gilbert. We did build a plant there and uh, it's being sold through a contract manufacturer who sells to Walmart and Target and CVS. So and, products on the shelves. And what does that product do? Uh, it's a joint health and it's a supplement, like a, a, a nutritional supplement. So it's used for joint health and eye health and nervous system health. Okay. Um, uh, natural fertilizers as well? What's going on with that? So it's very interesting. We're still learning, but we've done a number of trials now and seen some incredible uh, growth. It's not like standard fertilizer, NPK is what the standard fertilizers are. It's really more bioactive. So things that make wine grapes grow bigger, healthier, taste better, strawberries that are less bunchy, so they grow healthier. Um, with tomatoes, they grow them juicier, sweeter. Uh, these are ingredients that have been around for many, many years, but over the world, as people have as sort of simplified production methods, they've lost some of these enhancements. So and, algae puts them back. So, and, and algae puts them back how? Is it a liquid fertilizer? Are they granules? How does it work? Both. Uh, so some are sprayed on as a liquid, and then some are just powder that are mixed within a, a fertilizer mix. And is this the kind of thing that's similar to phosphorus type stuff? Is it, it, it Much more high end. So phosphorus is very basic fertilizer. This is more, think of it like your supplement for a human. We take vitamins or we eat healthy food. This is healthy food for your plants. Is that out there on the shelves right now? This uh... It is. We have some product out there. Okay. And now th we talked about therapeutics as well. Yeah. For, what, are we, what are we talking about here and how does algae play a part? Very interesting. Uh, so we did end up uh, purchasing 40% of a company that's based in San Diego uh, that has some synthetic biology around growing specialty proteins uh, for rem re remedies to things like dysentery, diarrhea, and uh, malaria and it's all still you know well out there but on the front end there's some animal science opportunity so gut health for dogs cats horses cows hogs my goodness uh, they eat the algae it's like a mother's milk effect it it uh it it's a uh, like eating healthy yogurt, it's the same idea. And is this FDA, I mean, are FDA We're going looking through at it? regulation right okay, now. Okay, so that that's, it still has so to go through still that have, particular process. You know, a year or two years before it's really on the market. Cosmetics as well? That's the easiest one. It's been amazing. We didn't even think about it. Uh, I, my background's energy, so cosmetics was a little new to me, but, uh, but the industry came to us once they started seeing what we were producing. And the reality is we were skipping over all these healthy oils that would be used for skin, for aging, and scar tissue improvements. Uh, we're, we're skipping all over all of that when we're making fuels. So now those same products, the same algae are being produced and being sold into the cosmetic space for anti-aging creams and such. And, and again, all of these things are either in the market or on the way to the market? Yes. yes. Okay. So, but, but, but biofuels, I, I, you haven't given up on biofuels, have you? I don't think I'd say given up. I've just put it on a long-term perspective. I mean, we really see it five to 10 years down the road. We don't see it in the next one to five years. In any we of really these don't. other subsets, do you see one of those exploding as far as algae is concerned? Uh, yes, we do. We do. I mean, these are multi-billion dollar markets, each one of them. The fertilizer market, the personal care cosmetic space, and the nutrition space are all very large markets. Uh, so in the short term, they're very good markets for a company like us to, to, to sell to and survive until the bigger value, higher commodity markets work. 
As far as the algae industry, your company, the industry uh, as a whole, how many folks are employed? What, uh, what kind of numbers you got? So last time I saw you was, I think, 2011. We were about 40 people. We're now over 140. Uh, we, had, uh, we were working out of a 15,000 square foot facility. We're now working out of 45,000 square feet plus two acres of demonstration plant and 20 acres of commercial production. And as far as patent, we just talked about patent trolls here, but as far as patents are concerned, uh, churning had, them out here? We had one last time I saw you. We now are sitting with over 80. We just had our 81st mm -hmm. come in yesterday. What's next for the algae industry? And A, and B, is there anything that's keeping algae from just exploding, being on the cover of every magazine, on the front of everyone's mind? It's still nascent technology. I mean, this is still pretty new in terms of the technology cycle. Uh, so, I, no, I don't think you're going to see it explode any time in the next year or two. I think it's going to grow quickly, but we're still probably one to two years away before you see algae production happening on every state in the country or in different parts of the world. But we expect it will. All we're right. betting on it. Well, congratulations on your success. Good luck you and uh, good to have you. Good to see you again. Good to see you, Ted. Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalists' Roundtable, the latest on Representative Kirsten Sinema's decision to stay put in the 9th Congressional District, and we'll discuss why state lawmakers decided not to kill Arizona's new education standards. That's Friday on the Journalists' Roundtable. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.